think of social media as the storefront in New York at Christmas time. You know, like it's presentational by its very nature, it's presentational. But what's the message that we're sending? That there's a standard by which to measure yourself, whether it's academically, aesthetically, chronologically, spiritually, you know, in terms of success is defined oddly and unusually and randomly at times. So in some ways, the message being sent is who you are and the essence of you, who you are is not enough and it's wrong. So here, we're going to show you how to be good. It's my and Bialik's breakdown. She's going to break it down for you. Because you know she knows a thing or two. So now she's going to break down. It's a breakdown. She's going to break it down. Hi, I'm Maya and Bialik, and welcome to my breakdown. This is the place where we break things down so you don't have to. I'm excited about the person that we're speaking to today. I'm also excited because I had to play it really cool when I've socialized with her in the past, but really wanted to have the conversation that we have with her today. A, a self-described shaky poodle. We're going to be talking to Alanis Morissette. It's very exciting. But first, my favorite shaky poodle, Jonathan Cohen. You're my favorite jagged little pill. <laughs> Hi, Jonathan. Hello. We're going to talk to someone who is extremely well-rounded in a lot of the arenas that we like to be well-rounded in. All the arenas. And she's Canadian. <laughs> and that, that is one of the arenas we like to be well-rounded in. She is Canadian. Um, she's had a really incredible career and also has an album out called The Storm Before the Calm, which is a meditation album. It's 11 tracks, all expressing kind of different, different states of being. And um, I plan to incorporate this album into my meditative practice. Um, I'm just very, very excited. This is the where I said, I'm going to fangirl out. <laughs> We're going to talk about all the things. It's very exciting. If someone's never heard of Alanis Morissette before, and they've been living under a rock, <laughs> give us the quick rundown before we introduce her. I mean, Alanis Morissette burst on the scene in 1995 with an album called Jagged Little Pill. She's had nine more albums after that. In 2019, Jagged Little Pill, the musical, made its Broadway debut. Um, you know, Alanis Morissette very famously was the voice of a lot of empowerment, female empowerment in an era of the 90s when it was really definitely she was ahead of her time. She then took a year and a half off, went to India, uh, got in touch with many aspects of herself that um, Personally, she felt needed expanding, but then she kind of brought that back uh, with her music. And she is a deep thinker um, in realms of spirituality and psychology. She also is a fellow uh, breastfeeding advocate and attachment parent and we're home birth uh, ladies that like each other to hang out and talk about breastfeeding and home birth with. I think that's it. Welcome everybody's favorite Canadian, Alanis Morissette. Break it down. It's really, really lovely to get to speak to you. This is my co-pilot, Jonathan, who's Hello, also nice Canadian. We like to oh, highlight the Canadian Moment thing. of silence. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I would like to talk to you about everything forever. But in the okay. time that we have with you, um, you know, there's so much that's going on now in your life that's super exciting. So maybe can we just like touch on a couple things and then we'll sort of go back in time and work our way back. Um, Let's do it. You have, you have a... Um, you have a meditation album out, which is called mm. The Storm Before the Calm. Mm. And um, it is available on Calm, but you can also get it elsewhere, correct? At, at other places that aren't so calm. Okay, got it. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah. You know, there's, there's something that you posted on Twitter, which I won't read back to you, but sort of about um, the, the necessity of kind of going into this space of, I yes. think the words you used were still, yeah, stillness and gentle inquiry, you know, in whatever way you feel kind of comfortable and inspired, what, you know, why this now and this way? Well, there's a certain responsibility that I had to start taking very actively and consciously around my temperament, you know, because I've, I've had the privilege and luxury of having some very um, I call it edge dwelling conversations with people who've been my teachers and mentors. And <clears throat> basically it got to the point where self-care and the whole well-being conversation, which beautifully became trendy over the last mm -hmm. few years, it became, it got to the point basically where self-care was no longer a luxury. It wasn't, oh, this is a treat once every six months or it got to the point where that version of restoration and we all have different versions, you know, some of us, it can be meditation. Some of us, it could be specifically not meditation because at our point in 
uh, what might be a trauma recovery journey, being left alone with our thoughts is not always the smartest way to go. So I qualify it a lot with this meditation record that being left alone, Peter Levine talks about sort of, I don't know what the term was that he used, but it's something along the lines of um, anxiety induced relaxation. This Peter but, Levine you know, that I have the book oh, of right guy, here. That, okay. got it. Just Moment checking. of silence again. <laughs> um, so yes, uh, basically not everyone, you know, the panacea in terms of meditation and mindfulness, it's not actually the route for everybody in the world. So, so I like to qualify that this meditation might not be the way, in fact, maybe a guided meditation or a, or a Q and a, or an inquiry with some support, some relationality thrown in there to make it um, a little bit more regulating than some, but, but for me with music, sometimes that can be the portal, um, into just getting to that state of witnessing and listening and inquiring and getting to the bottom of a lot of things that I have to have extreme safety to explore, you know, and sometimes I find that <clears throat> certainly in my relationship, my friendships, my marriage sometimes, and then sometimes I'll find it in therapy, but the pay dirt moments of really getting to the bottom of some really intense stuff is is usually around journaling and meditating and really listening and really asking the tougher question of my multiple parts that are showing up and attempting to act out. So you're you're being very kind also to people who may not want to meditate. And I, I'd like to sort of put that um You'd like to shame them publicly. No, no, no. Should we no. do it? <laughs> no, I, I would like to I would like to create, you know, the safety that you created for people who um, may need more guidance. I'm going to sort of put that, you know, in a separate category. But um, I do, I'm not asking you to shame people, but um, I, I do, I do want to know sort of just, and I'm not asking you to be the authority on all things meditation, but I, I've, I've found this with people kind of with yoga where they're like, I don't like yoga. I don't sit still. I don't do it. And I've heard this with meditation too. Like, that's not for me. My mind is too busy. But I can you speak a little bit to not the category of people who, let's say, need other processes, you know, to go through yeah. to, you know, yeah. but to get for, wherever they're going. Exactly. But for people yeah. who are just like, that sounds, you know, fill in the adjective. It sounds dumb. It sounds for hippies. It's not for me. I like kickboxing instead. What is the thing that stillness, that silent, that learning to breathe, for example, what does that bring? Well, if someone were to say I get that through kickboxing, I would my begged question in that moment would be you get what? You know, what what does it provide for you? What does it make available to you? So it could just be that we're all chasing this hyper presence. Mm. So if if staring at a candle does it for you, if listening to a certain kind of music does it for you, some people it's dancing, some people it's exactly kickboxing or UFC watching or whatever it is. So I have no sense of the the right way to do anything at this point, especially after becoming a mother. I had a lot of opinions before I was a <laughs> That's mom. That's the best time after. to have opinions about children is when you don't oh, have any. When you don't have any. <laughs> and I was riddled with many opinions. And then after I had children, I just stopped talking, basically. <laughs> I just started listening and empathizing really large. So, um, so what the meditative invitation really is is can we be with what's going on in this moment? And for those of us who have traumas that aren't resolved or developmental stuff that hasn't been touched on yet, um, it can be overwhelming. It can flood the system, especially if you're sensitive. You know this as a neurobiologist, mm -hmm. I'm assuming. Um, so, so just being responsible for what floods us, if we're highly sensitive, if we're empaths, if we haven't had enough time alone or we don't have enough support and the relationality of someone supporting us in a safe context, if we don't have that, there can be ways to tiptoe into that, maybe through a guided meditation. I definitely benefited from that in my 20s when I was touring alone in hotel rooms. I wasn't at a place where I could be left alone to my own devices without the voices in there getting really mean. So guided meditations were perfect for me because I could just follow and I would notice that I'd start feeling regulated again and and then in that place of feeling somewhat calm, you know, I always feel like resting is enlightenment. Like if we can truly rest, that's when I think I ideally have all the access to mm -hmm. whatever it is, art, clarity, clear on what to prioritize. It all becomes really clear for me when I have that state or that space. But so many of our lifestyles now are such that we're just operating from such a flooded place from overwhelm, you know, the, the so-called invisible load of moms, which I would love to have be rendered visible. Um, you know, just the details of what our minds are doing. And I, when I hear people say what, what it sounds like you've heard a lot too, of there's too much going on. I'm too busy. You know, 
you're right. We live in a culture now that is the norm. The set point seems to be overstimulation and that's just been normalized, mm -hmm. which is not how we're built, right? We're not built to take in that information and stay in that chronic revved red for that long. It's interesting you mentioned music as sort of a portal for um, either meditation or contemplation. Y you know, there's people have different relationships with music and I'll just use your music as an example. Um, your, your music is very, very important to me and it speaks to a time and I'm sure you, you know, there are people all over yeah, the chapters. freaking world, right, who, who have specific associations, let's say, with, you know, your music and for me it is. It's the lyrics, it's the time, it's how old I was, it's how mm. I identified with you, you know, all the things that we put on you. Yeah, how, we're, we're here to be projected upon exactly, anyway. Exactly, that's so. what, you I know, love it, yeah. <laughs> um, but, you know, I've also, so I'm a fan of the Cocteau Twins, which is mm. a very, very ethereal, you know, very mm. music heavy, very lush. You don't yes. even know if they're speaking English, but it doesn't really matter, you it know? It doesn't matter. Right, it doesn't matter. <laughs> and I actually know all of the lyrics and I have no idea what I'm even saying, you know, for most yes. of the songs of that genre of music that I love. But yeah. for meditation music, which I didn't even know is a thing until I started actively meditating and I use a free app, but... What's interesting is, and I say this with all the love in my heart, you know, when I look at, you have 11 tracks, correct? On, I, I think yeah, so, yeah. On this album. <laughs> and I'm yeah. going to be super honest. I'm like, how different can they be? And then I looked right. at the titles and I was like, oh. You're like, oh. <laughs> okay, so there's different things. But, you know, when I think of meditation music, Jonathan, I think you'd agree. It's like, you know, and then it like goes right. into Which a I like. Which I also love. Right. <laughs> but I was like. I need that desperately sometimes. Well, and I thought if anyone can make 11 different tracks, it's Alanis Morissette. So, <laughs> of 11 different feelings right. or states and, of being. Correct. Yeah. Okay. So feelings, <clears throat> states of being. So um, I'm just going to, there's 11 words. Everyone can be patient. Light, <laughs> heart, explore, space, purification, restore, awakening, mm. ground, safety, mania, and vapor. Ooh. Talk a little bit about <laughs> sort of how this kind of evolved. Do you set out and say, I want to write something about Explore and I'm going to make it sound like Explore? Did you name them mm -hmm. after? Is it about a state that you're in when you create them? It's it's the inside out. And I, I appreciate that some people are really great at doing the outside in approach. I just can't do it if someone tells me intellectually how to create something that in some senses has to be done from this unfettered listening state, you know, listening and heeding is kind of the practice for me. Um, but if someone gives me a sense, like I remember years ago, or someone at the record company said, I really need you to write a party song, you know, and I was like, party song. <laughs> well, I could write a party song about my experience at a party and how I'm scared to be social. And does that make me anti so, you know, but the running joke is like, I can't, I can't be dictated what to do intellectually for a process that requires a full somatic you know, receptive state. So with these songs, I wrote them and then later named them because I, I attempted to get a sense of what was being offered, you know, and mania was the one that um, was a little challenging for some people because it's counterintuitive to think that embracing chaos, you know, Dan Siegel, the rigidity chaos continuum, embracing chaos in some senses sounds extreme, which can sound really scary to those of us who are recovering from addictions or whatever it is. But for me, my experience, whether it's with movement, dancing, being on stage, is that in really finding that groundedness inside the mania can be a really great release of energy. It can shift everything for me. So there's a tenacity that is asked of us in theory in this kind of chaotic musical expression. So somehow including the mania in the conversation is really an invitation for all these parts and all these voices and all these archetypes within me that are just sometimes fighting for the front seat of the car. You know, there's there's the mom, there's the rock star, there's the activist, there's the student, there's the scholar, there's the freak show, you know, like all these parts that just need a moment in the sun. And they can all get really loud if I haven't spent enough time doing that inner dialoguing. And it's, you know, it's just waiting for me whenever I stop, whenever I get really still, it's all, they all just wait for mommy's attention. <laughs> Mind Alex Breakdown is supported by Zelle. When anyone sends you money or if you need to get paid back for something, how about you ask them to use Zelle? With Zelle, the money goes straight into your bank account and it works even if the sender bank's somewhere different than you do in the US. This is my favorite thing about Zelle. I use Zelle for 
a lot of different interactions in my life with people who want to be paid directly. I don't have to deal with an invoice. Zelle is also great if you're splitting dinner with a bunch of people. I recently had a table made. Like, I, I really love it. The money goes straight into your bank account, typically in minutes between enrolled users. And you don't have to download another app. This is the best part. It's already in your banking app. It's in over 1,800 different banking apps. Always double check that the sender has your correct US mobile number or email address so the money goes to the right place and it goes straight into your bank account. Look for Zelle in your banking app today. My MB Alex Breakdown is supported by BetterHelp. Jonathan, you know sometimes I focus on problems. Sometimes. Like I get stuck. Not on the solutions, but on just on what's wrong. I would like, I would prefer to get stuck on solutions, but it's hard to train your brain to go to solutions when honestly I'm very conditioned to like sit in a problem but there's really nothing better than learning how to find solutions and have tools to help you find solutions so you can get out of focusing on the problem and I have used therapy for this um, for for most of my life and you might say why do you still have trouble because I'm a work in progress but what I have learned is that Becoming a better problem solver and being able to find solutions makes it easier to accomplish goals, no matter how big or small, whether it's something in my house or something in my career, this is still something I need help with. And maybe you'd like to give therapy a try. Jonathan and I recommend BetterHelp. It's convenient, accessible, affordable, and it's completely online. You can switch therapists anytime if it's not a good fit, and you get matched with someone after filling out a super brief survey. It's very easy. So if you'd like to be a better problem solver, therapy can get you there. Go to betterhelp.com slash break today to get 10% off your first month. That's betterhelp.com slash break. I think that's a it's a good place to sort of you know take us back in time a little bit um you know to sort of who you were before you were all those things to all of these people um you are you are from canada you're from mm -hmm. name a city or a province jonathan help me ottawa She's ottawa, from ontario ottawa which is a city, city in the province capital. of it's the ontario. capital the capital of canada <laughs> it's the capital of Canada. People get really angry I'm when sorry. you edit that out. I'm sorry. It's the capital of Canada. Of course yeah. it is. Everyone knows that. Exactly. You also did something interesting as a child. You had a presence as a, um, a performer, even when you were yeah. a youngin. Yes. And, um, you know, I, I don't want to label it too much, but you were part of, um, you know, a, a mainstream you know, gen I don't want to say generic. I don't mean it in a bad way, but like a mainstream. <laughs> I don't want to say it, but I'm going to say it. No, no, no. Like I, I don't mean generic. Like mm, so generic, so basic. I know what you mean. I mean Main it was like mainstream. Yeah, pop. you were part of a Super pop, pop mainstream kind of. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Here's the question. Still am, but so, yeah, right. But yeah. here's the question: Were you mm -hmm. you then in that different casing? Uh, yes, and. It was a little bit more presentational. I don't think I was sophisticated enough in my emotional culling to be able to have written wildly autobiographical songs mm -hmm. at 10. Right. Um, although, you know, I touched on some songs. There was a song that I wrote when I was 16 that started being more vulnerable. But to be perfectly honest, I was in environments where my songwriting prowess was not encouraged. You know, so there were a lot of things that were focused on and encouraged songwriting was not one of them. And, and when I left the situation I was in in Canada and started fresh, for lack of a better term, in LA, there was this freedom. It was just like a big open road. And there were no preconceived notions of what I'd done before in terms of genre. And I just basically integrated all of it. I love pop. I love cheese. I love, you know, self-expression and non-rhyming and experimenting with the voice like a paintbrush, you know. So basically... Eventually, it all came out once I was in an, a different environment where the collaborators or producers just thought, okay, here's a woman who wants to express herself. How great. Let's support her. I like to remind people, you know, this was a very different time. There really wasn't like an internet as you know it. There'll always be someone who's like, the internet began in 1932. Like, I don't know, but... Uh, yes. In terms and of... No. <laughs> right. In terms of sort yeah. of where you were placed and where we all were at that yeah, you know, point context. in time, we were still like, oh my gosh, MTV is a thing. And they make TV shows too, where they show you what happens behind the scenes. If, like, we were still learning about the world as it were. Um, yes. I graduated high school in 1993 and I was still working on Blossom um, up until I went to college two years later. Mm. Um, 
And I, I will say, I mean, there's many things that I can say. And it's also interesting because we have interacted socially outside of cameras. Um, we're yes. both part of a, you know, um, home birth, extended breastfeeding, um, holistic attachment parenting, homeschooling, yes. unschooling kind of universe. Yes. Um, but... You know, it's it's wonderful to have you here, and I hope it doesn't make you uncomfortable that I also like. There's a fangirl element of. <laughs> no, I love it, um, and no, me but, and me for you. Well, me and to and you. also, I I don't just say it like, oh my god, I loved your music. Like, this was a time in my life when I had been, you know, on television for five years since I was fourteen. As a child, as a, as a, as a you know, I was there. very young. Like, I started acting at eleven, but you know, um, there was a me inside that wanted to mm -hmm. come out. You know, I was very like America's like, look, she's like a strange Jewish sweetheart, you know, <laughs> like yes. I was, you know, I was sort that's of, that's how placed, I describe you. Now. That's how you, that's how I describe you is what's yes. funny. You've been consistent by the way. That's right. <laughs> um, no, but I remember that, you know, the person inside of me who the first time I heard smells like teen spirit, like it was like my heart exploded. Like, what is this music? Mm. What is this consciousness? And, mm. You know, for for many of us, especially the feisty, the girls who had been called a bitch and who were teased for mm. not shaving their armpits and their legs, like mm. there was this person, you know, who sang about medication, which like was something mm. I whispered about. You know, I've been in therapy, mm. you know, since I'm 17 and like someone else is talking about medication and about you know, things that back then nice girls didn't talk about, you know? Right. And yes. it was an extremely powerful moment, you know, for for you to share that part of you. And like, I had the middle part and the hair down to my tush. Like, I was so, no, but like, I was so empowered by the fact that you existed. And I think that was the experience of a lot of females. And... <laughs> I can't believe it was 25 years ago also, because when I, he and it's true, when I hear really anything off that album, I am right back, you know, I am right back in my room alone, weeping, writing my sad mm. poetry. Mm. What? <laughs> this past what, weekend. This past weekend also I did Yeah, that. just like last night, yeah. Um, but <laughs> when, when you sort of like, you know, when you look back at that time, did you know that's what you were gonna do <laughs> for humanity? <laughs> uh, what I knew, I'd seen images of my future in terms of just, you know, pictures, uh, prophetic pictures in, in, per, in a personal way. So I'd seen myself, I'd envisioned touring the planet, traveling a ton. I had that bug instilled in me quite early on from my parents who lived to travel. So I saw myself traveling and performing and movement and sweat and some blood and tears. I saw all of that. Um, and that's all I really saw. So I just kept showing up. I kept just keeping my eye on that prize without, without even being aware I was keeping my eye on any prize. I just kept those pictures alive. And actually, after a lot of them were made manifest, I actually didn't know where to go next. You know, all of a sudden the pictures went dark and I just thought, oh, am I supposed to die now? Is that what's... <laughs> Is that what this means? Um, no, I just needed a moment to regroup and a lot of brass rings and, and all kinds of achievements, quote unquote, had been reached. And then it just, it begs the question, well, where do we go now? You know, so I just kept going deeper and deeper within because interiority was so terrifying to me. I just thought, well, if it's that terrifying, I want to keep going. But I, I couldn't do it without, you know, therapists and friends and safe environments. So there's no way I could have moved forward. Although I did do a lot of workshops and I'd, sh I'd show up for all these things that were not appropriate for me to be there in the sense that I wasn't really protecting myself very well, but I was so hungry for knowledge and hungry for ongoing education that I didn't care. So there was a bit of a carelessness to how I approached it. Um, and when I say it, I mean, the work that I was doing and the psychotherapeutic meets spiritual inquiry and showings up and um, you know, following mentors and reading, reading my teacher's books cover to cover 12 times. And so I just felt like a real student. Were you going into meditative trances to see things? Or was just this something that you, when you closed your eyes at night, could you picture it? Or did you feel a momentum? What did it feel like? It was it was all of those things. It was a uh, it was a propulsion almost like a catalytic push energetically. It was pictures. You know, if I was quiet for a minute or if someone said, what do you want to be when you get older? Boom. I would, I would see this just me traveling and touring and meeting a ton of people. I have the high novelty seeking sort of temperament combined with the shaky poodle, <laughs> sensitive empath, debilitated temperament. So I'm a wallflower that has 
you know, some sassiness. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's like a black stallion with a poodle temperament inside the black stallion. <laughs> Let's talk about anger. Yay. Your album was a representation or a communication of anger for many people who could not express it themselves. So Mime and I have talked about anger before, um, not to out her, but I tend to do that on this podcast. I have an anger problem. Do you? I have a rage problem. So I, really? I only have, I have no anger or I have all the anger and it goes violent places. Dude, that's, that's Canadian. <laughs> I've been, wait an honorary Canadian. been waiting my whole life. We tolerate, we tolerate so much. <laughs> that's tolerate, right. tolerate, tolerate. And people would credit me or praise me for being so highly tolerant. And I would say, it's not awesome how much I tolerate actually, because yeah. I don't set the boundaries until I'm imploding. Yeah. And I exploding. also, I don't, I don't have any idea what like healthy anger looks like. Well, it looks like punching a pillow rather yeah, than your partner. Yeah, but that's not, no, like apparently you can like, <laughs> this is a new thing and I'm 46 years old and just this last year I learned that some people say things and they say like, I'm angry about that and they don't, you know, you, you don't name call or shame or scream, but like, I'm angry about that. And then supposedly you can feel better after expressing that. I was like, what? It only yeah. feels better when I slam a door, break something, throw something or walk out. Well, what if you get both going? Like for me, because my son is at that age where, you know, I'm attempting to, to walk that fine line of containment is valuable if you want to get along with people in the sandbox. But you don't want to contain to the point where you're repressing or sublimating because then you will explode and we will act out and I will break something, maybe a bone or a glass or I don't, you know and for me a laptop I think a phone anger gets a, a laptop <laughs> fill in the blank uh so I think what happens along the way is that anger got a bad rep because it was associated with the destructing actings out of anger that's my fault so I gave anger a bad you name because all and the if things you hadn't I broke done that our planet would be in a completely different place so I hope that you really <laughs> go away and think about what you've done <laughs> um no I think you know as soon as someone says, you know, I have a rage problem or it, it feels terrifying, right? It's the lack of control. But the beauty of anger is that it catalyzes, it kickstarts things. It has us show up for activism. It has us be able to say no. You know, it has us show up. So I wouldn't want to eradicate anger as if we even could. It's more that how do I move it? You know, and for in my family... I have to just put it into words. So, I'll, you know, we have a freedom to use any words we want as long as it's not, you know, debasing to somebody. Mm -hmm. But we can we can say whatever we need to say if we're putting it into words. And then physicality of it has to happen. Like attempting to say to a young person who has hormones running through them or frankly, me, perimenopause hormones running oh, through. I have it's that. just like, okay, so I have all this anger. Even two nights ago, I just texted my husband and I said, you know, just for your sake, <laughs> I'm raging right now and I love you and you need to stay away from me. And I mean it, you know, because I just, I'm just slightly feeling out of control. So I had enough wherewithal to at least isolate myself so that I could just rage out. And it looks like anything. It looks like punching. I could punch the bed. I did it last night. When I'm just ragey, I just punch. Um, so that helps as long can as can I come you know, over and some... punch your bed? Yes, <laughs> you can anytime you want. We have to sit with it. And it's like there's levels to it, right? If you suppress it, ignore it, say I'm not supposed to feel or it. Or someone invalidates it mm -hmm. or yes. You're not supposed to be angry and intellectualize it. Then it, you know, eventually gets shoved down and you, it turns into rage. But like to be able to be like, I am feeling out of control right now. And that's an OK state to be in as long as you're not acting out of control towards someone else. Just I mean, just don't hurt yourself. My my whole thing when any of us are raging and we're fire, you know, this family's pretty fiery. Um, I just go, don't hurt yourself and don't hurt the stuff. <laughs> you know, a lot of my anger and a lot of my rage is very old because <laughs> I, I collect it and I save it. And right. It's like in my little knapsack. And, and our families. Oh, right, and exactly. Our well, grand, grand. Right. Yeah. So, and there's like, there's definitely an intergenerational, uh, you know, trauma Element. aspect of it. But, you know, I think for women especially, um, you know, we learn other ways to turn it inward because mm. uh, women especially are not encouraged really to show, you know, those kind of emotions. And yes. I talk a Sadness lot. Sadness and anger. Right. Yeah. So I t mm -hmm. I've talked here, you know, pretty openly about disordered eating uh, myself. Um, mm. And, 
you know, one of the ways that we feel in control because anger is it's out of control. You know, one of the mm, ways that we can feel that way. Right. Yeah. One of the ways that, you know, we try and have control is we'll either control other people, <laughs> which is also. Mm, a, yeah, you that's know, the go to. Right. right. That's, that's, a, that's go a go usually. to. Um, yeah. But, you know, kind of environment beating up ourselves, you know, for many children, especially and, um, you know, children and teenagers, if you if you turn it on yourself, there's there's kind of it's the happiest dead end ever because no one's going to point it out. Right. Because you can you can keep it inside. Right. You can keep it quiet. Co yeah. Correct. And no one needs to know. Um, it's a very you know, it's a it feels like a very safe way to kind of process. But, um, you know, anger and resentment. Those are the things like you can if you list a hundred things that bother you, you could probably categorize all of them as either based in anger or resentment. My MB Alex Breakdown is supported by Cozy Earth. Remember the last time you had two great nights sleep in a row? Still thinking? Well, we sleep better thanks to Cozy Earth sheets. Cozy Earth was created to enhance people's lives with the softest, most luxurious, and environmentally friendly bedding in the world. With over 5,000 five-star reviews, they've never wavered on that promise. Cozy Earth sheets are made from premium 100% viscose from bamboo, which means they're extremely soft, they're lightweight and temperature regulating. So you will sleep more comfortably year round. I didn't even know that was a thing. Sleeping sheets regularly? Can... I didn't even know that sheets can make such a difference and Cozy Earth sheets can make a difference. I don't mess around when it comes to comfort. These are next level comfort. When I met Mime, she used to sleep on sandpaper and had no understanding of how to be comfortable. This has changed everything. You can get cozy now. Our audience can save 35% on Cozy Earth. Go to CozyEarth.com slash break. Save 35% all backed by a 100 night sleep guarantee. That's CozyEarth.com slash B-R-E-A-K. CozyEarth.com slash break. You've been open talking about kind of disordered eating. And I do wonder, you know, for you, do you think of that separate from your role kind of publicly and in the industry? Is that something that was a way that, you know, you think you would have kind of chosen or was there extra kind of pressure that way because of what you were experiencing, especially as a young woman? You mean subject to the to the messaging that right. we have to look like 2% yeah. of the planet? Um, I think it was compounded by being in the public eye, even to this day. You know, there are times where I forget that I'm even a body. I'm not, I'm not obsessed with mirrors. So we don't have very many in my home. So I'm trying to add more because as a kid, it's actually valuable to like dance in front of a mirror. So I'm adding mirrors. Um, I think what wound up happening was it was already something happening in the patriarchal context of the planet, you know, that, that women are supposed to look like this 2% and men too have the same challenges, but it's so much more compounded because of the context of patriarchy. Um, so these women were basically being told, I was being told, we were being told that 2% of the planet, the other 98% of the planet has to look like that. So the giant pervasive messaging is there's something wrong with you. And here's what you have to chase. And it's nothing like how you were born to be. Tell us what the 2% is. Are you talking uh, dress size? Are you talking? Yes. Okay, got dress it. No, size, I just want you to be specific. Abs that are pronounced, got low it. body fat. Um, you know, and every era has its different indication of what, quote, you know, quote unquote, beauty is of that decade or whatever. It's usually thin. Right, right, right. Yeah. Meaning like the Marilyn Monroe, you know, era is is long over and we are well into a different, you know, era. Yes and no. Right. Right. It's right. like, oh, we still have the dress that we're trying to fit into. <laughs> That's right. You know, so it's, you know, the the pressure is the same. It gets even more so now because of social media in general being about, I think of social media as the storefront in New York at Christmas time. You know, like it's presentational by its very nature, it's presentational. But what's the message that we're sending? That there's a standard by which to measure yourself, whether it's academically, aesthetically, chronologically, spiritually, you know, in terms of success is defined oddly and unusually and randomly at times. So in some ways, the message being sent is who you are and the essence of you, who you are is not enough and it's wrong. So here we're going to show you how to be good, you know, and it sets up this whole binary, extreme, unrealistic, immoderate impossibility. 
you know, so we spend the rest of our lives beating ourselves up because we're not some standard. And then what on our deathbed at 100 and at this point, 150, we're going to be thinking, God, I, I missed the whole experience because I felt like everything I was doing was wrong or I was looking wrong or speaking in a, in a wrong way or whatever it is. So just giving a little bit more freedom now to just go, okay, so what's the difference between feeling cute and, and adhering to a standard? You know, what, what, what has me feel, um, alive, you know, in, in, in a non wildly, uh, medicated way. Like if, if, if me taking a shower or me doing cryotherapy or whatever it is that I do in my rituals, if it brings back a sense of excitement and passion and curiosity and hyper presence, then great, that works. It's not destructive. It won't kill me. So my, well, Jonathan and I both separately have a 14 year old. And then I also have an almost 17 year old and, you know, there's, I'm in it. Um, and I mean, you are as well. And, you mm -hmm. know, there was something we were talking about yeah. the other day, you know, because, um, you know, their generation is very, especially we live in Los Angeles. So they're very, very hyper aware about um, being open. You know, when you talk about things like choice feminism or really just choice existing, you know, and my mm -hmm. boys, we were mm -hmm. talking about it and it, they were asking seriously, like, well, what if someone wants to blah, blah, blah. And I said, here's my rule. I have no problem if someone wants to blah, blah, blah. The question is, is the reason they're doing something because mm -hmm. the culture has already decided that that's the way you get success, be yes. attractive. You know, if someone says, I'd like to shave my eyebrows and pencil them in, by all means, have a great time. But if it's, this is a totally random example, but if it is that society has told us we have to shave our eyebrow, like that's the only way to look attractive, that's right. where I say we have to kind of question that and I think the yeah, same question is the indoctrinations right. and the messagings from way pre pre-birth at this point the messaging is there I wanted you to speak to that also in the spiritual realm because this is something that you started talking about um you know and even with thank you right you brought an awareness that a lot of people weren't yet ready to embrace and you know, I, I feel like in many ways you were very ahead of your time in terms of that kind of mindfulness, that kind of this has been a whirlwind I need to regroup. And it was done very consciously and in a really meaningful way. And I'm, I'm curious as you think about sort of your journey, you know, from this kind of explosion that you had to then trying to calibrate, like, who am I really in the face of all this? How do you see that in terms of sort of what in many cases is a like a pop psych and sort of trendy notion of like spirituality or like wear these clothes to have the best, you know, meditative experience. I'm curious what you see because you really were ahead of your time with that kind of consciousness. Oh, that, uh, thank you. And I, th I think the consciousness that you might be speaking to is, is a degree of, I don't know if you do the Enneagram stuff. Of course I I'm, do. I'm a four with a five wing. Of so, course you are. So I'm, also, I'm, a, I'm a four as well. Yes. Are you, do you know what your wing is? <laughs> I can't remember my wing. I've known it. It's a personal I, question. I don't think it's a five. I feel, I think, well. Maybe a three? Well, at my, at my, at my healthiest, Best. I look more like a one, <laughs> which is kind of funny. Um, th at my unhealthiest, yeah. I'm the most unhealthy four you've ever seen. And that's kind of where yeah, I resonate. Same. Yeah, that's where I resonate. Yeah. Four and then f so the five is is really about the observer, yeah. right? And ever since I was even pre-verbal, I just remember just watching humans. So fascinating to me, whether, you know, you, you might relate to this one, whether it's the brain or the stomach or the proprioception or the feelings or the sublimation or the messages or the patriarchy or the context or the sh I was just there's just it's like a candy store for me the humanity thing is rugged and beautiful and terrifying you know so for me I just always felt like I was observing everything to bring it home in some ways process it and then comment you know comment through a photo comment through a song comment through a keynote talk comment through a conversation you know, so just continuing to show up to comment and bouncing between the micro and the macro. So zooming in on the, I need to make sure I get to the audition on time for the school musical with my son, all the way out to, you know, what is self-expression in the world and how can we comment on that and invite people in to feel safe, you know, and so just bouncing between the two. And if I don't do micro or macro enough, if I'm not serving publicly, I really do feel like something's missing. And if I'm not serving privately and quietly, something's missing. So I, as best as I can anyway, I attempt to keep those moderately cooking along as I go. 
it was really, really lovely to get to connect with you this way. We super appreciate it. And so great to speak with you too. I think so highly of you. Whenever I hear your name in the world, I just go, yes. Oh, thank so you. Happy you're here. Well, hopefully our paths yeah. will cross again. Thank you so much. That's awesome. Thanks. Alrighty. Bye. Bye. Is that what I sound like? She sounds Canadian. I can hear it. Yeah, that's what you sound like. I never think I sound Canadian, but when I'm listening to her, I'm like, oh, You're like, she's, oh she's such an Ottawa hick. <laughs> No, that's putting <laughs> words in my mouth. But I was like... Yes, she's, that's what you sound like. So, a boat, a boat, a boat, a boat. So there was a time period where I was like living in LA for, I don't know, like five years. I thought I was totally You integrated. sound more Canadian because we were speaking to her now. <laughs> and I w went to the Trader Joe's checkout and I was chatting with this guy. And he says to me, where are you from? And I'm like, what? <laughs> he totally thought I was from somewhere else. Yeah, you are Canadian and you sound Canadian. And she does too. I know, it's a blind spot. I don't hear it. Oh, hey. <laughs> I don't know if I accept that as a accurate depiction of us, I think, but I can hear I it think in she's, her. I mean, there's a lot of cool Canadians, but she's she's up there. I she got, is up there. It's a high bar to ascend to. She dated Ryan Reynolds. He's also Canadian. That's like I mean, Canadian years ago. royalty. A million years ago. That is Canadian royalty. What was her emotional state when writing this anthem that expressed all the anger for all the people who couldn't express the anger? Was she angry when writing it? Like what? I'll answer that for her. Yes. All right, great. Let's move on. <laughs> yep. Um, no, I, I would have liked to know more about that. Um, well, I think I was kind of hinting at that when I asked, like when she was kind of, you know, squeaky clean, more like pop, you know, in her youth. That person was was growing, you know, in there. Where and was the anti culture? I think girls and women all over the world, um, in particular, identified with that, and many boys and men. Uh, but she really was ahead of her time in terms of the way she presented herself and the way she, the way she wrote, the way she appeared publicly. Most of the place where I feel her music is, this is going to sound super specific. It happened when we were listening to uh, You Ought to Know. And as I'm looking over the lyrics to my favorite song, You Learn, from that album, there is chills that comes up only the back of the left side of my head. And it wraps around my ear. I don't know why. That's my Alanis tangle. <laughs> the reason Let's there is- Let's trademark that. There is something that happens. And, you know, I, I am a- uh, I, I care about lyrics in a way that sometimes other people don't. Caveat being that she's memorized I, every lyric of almost every song she's ever heard, even if she's only okay, heard it once. So that's not fair to say that I memorized it. That sounds like an active process. Oh, no, no. It just goes it in there. It is memorized. <laughs> it doesn't come out. And I don't know how you I actually don't. memorize it. You just hear it once and it just stays in there. Not once, but I have a very strange uh, um, auditory memory. I also have a... a a vaguely photographic memory, but that's not how I learn lyrics, but... Check out the Instagram page where I'm going to post how she reads a book. <laughs> okay, so the thing that happens, though... She's a robot. There's something that happens with certain chord progressions and certain melodies mm -hmm. that do something different in my brain than other things. Um, I will give you examples of this, and you're welcome to look these up. There's a song called Suit of Lights by the great Elvis Costello. It is on an album called King of America, which came out, just want to be, um, just want to, what year was, King, uh, 1986. So in 1986, this album came out, King of America, and I did not know of this album in 1986. I was 11 years old and whatever. When I first heard this song, Suit of Lights by Elvis Costello, the first time I heard it, I said, I know this song. There, I know this song. Like, this must be a cover of some song that I have been listening to since before the universe was even created. Like, it felt that deep. You downloaded it in your consciousness before I, listening? I don't, I don't know. But there's something that happens in that, whatever that is with my brain. I don't think it's everybody's brain, but that song. And I've had this with a handful of music in my life. And there is something about the last line before each chorus in this song you learn that just makes my soul do a flip-flop. The first one is, wait until the dust settles. And the way she says it, you wait until the dust settles. She does that whole pretty thing. She does it with, when wait until the dust settles. She does it with, you wait and see when the smoke clears. And there's something, it's right now. I have chills do up the back of the- Do it again for us. No. Please. You wait and see when the smoke clears. It's so pretty. Anyway, not the way I sing it. 
the way she sings it. And the final one is the fire trucks are coming up around the bend. And they're, <laughs> the fire trucks are coming up around the bend. Anyway, there's something about the way she sings, the chord progression that's leading to the chorus. It just, it does something to me that that is very... I don't know. It's very elaborate. It's uh, very emotional. It makes me cry. And I, it's not that I don't love the song, but there's something about the dust settling and the smoke clearing and fire trucks. It's like, oh, it just gets me every time. Oh, anyway. What do you feel? That's, I don't know. I feel chills. Um, and it makes you think of? I don't, it's... Like, if I really am honest about what it reminds me of, there's something about feeling like my personality, who I am, is something that has to be deciphered and is dangerous. I don't know if that's what she intended, but that's what it means to me. And I also think what a tremendous responsibility it is to be a singer or a writer or really any kind of person that's putting yourself out there because... I have this like deep emotional connection to something that she wrote that she may have been thinking about who knows what, but that becomes my experience. And every single time, and I make my children shut up when this song comes on the radio and I sing really loud and she sings higher than me. So it's not so pretty, but I feel it very deeply. I start to cry like I just did. The power of that is for me is, is that, that there is some chaos you associate it to your personality. I, I associate it to that, like, there's going to be some emergency in our life at some point, and it's going to be all fucked up, no matter what that <laughs> is. And we all have had that messed up moment that, like, the, the fire trucks are coming for. Like, that's just, like, oh, no, bad things are happening. Mm -hmm. And you can't get away. You can't get away from it. Mm -hmm. Also, when she says melt it down, there's some, it's like it just gives me chills. There's something about it. She says melt it down. You're going to have to eventually anyway. And I always I think of gold. I think of gold being melted down, like taking. I think what? of our current reality. OK. Nothing we think is real. She has a great line that we didn't talk about. And I'll use this opportunity of you fumbling with technology to get it in. <laughs> We're here to be projected upon. Well, I think she meant we public people. No, I mean everyone. Oh, no, that was just for me. <laughs> that wasn't for you. It's. You think it's everybody? It's human interaction. Oh. The people around us, we project our reality oh. onto them and they onto us. Why can't you let us. me and Alanis have something that's just ours? <laughs> yeah, I mean, to say that, that we are all kind of living that experience of other people's expectations, judgments. Um, Realities. What do I project beliefs? on you? Oh, so many things. I have to remind myself... <laughs> My version of Alana saying, how are we? I have to remind myself, just because I can't meet someone else's need doesn't mean that they're needy. <laughs> wow, crickets. Yes. It's very deep. Just because you can't meet someone else's need, it doesn't mean they're needy. No, it doesn't mean that. Because it's easy for me to be like, oh, someone else has a problem if I'm not oh. able to... E uh, rise to an oh, expectation. Oh, you mean it's easy when someone has a need that you can't meet to be like, you're so needy. It's yeah, like saying to someone fault. you're so sensitive when someone's expressing that they're upset about something. Well, yeah, you're so sensitive, that's exactly. right? That's interesting. The other thing to circle back on... You didn't ask what I project on you. Everything? No? Well, I think a lot of us in relationships project our relationships with our parents. Oh, yeah, the line that if the person you're with isn't your parent or isn't like your parent you will turn them into them. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, Like I can bring all the dysfunction for the entire couple. <laughs> so when you go to try to find a partner, they say right. you're going to find someone like your parents. And the rub is that even if they're not like your parents, over time, because you're working out the stuff with your parents, you're going to turn that person into aspects of your parents. Right. Well, or you will project. Or you will project so that they become and they reflect back to you aspects of your parent and the stuff that you need to work on with them. The other thing that she said was about truly resting and still points. And if we can actually have real serious rest, that's when she talked about having intuition. You're getting upset. I can see your face. I'm not upset. You, you're getting your faces doing that thing again. <laughs> <laughs> I think that... Because um, she talks about being powered by all the information around us and that we're well, like yeah, so, charged. So tell us, what do you think she meant? What is truly resting? 
I think most people pass out versus rest. <laughs> I mean, I think most of us go to the point of exhaustion, not to or, pick on, or numb out or numb out, not to pick on Scott. We were talking about sleep patterns and routines, and he was talking about it's okay to say that he watches YouTube and he puts a timer on his YouTube and that gets him to sleep. And I know a lot of people. Oh, I don't even put a timer. Sometimes I wake up at three in the morning and some show is on that I wasn't even watching. What does truly resting mean? Yes, Jonathan, what does truly resting mean? That's the question. When are we in a place where we get out of the bubble of the constant stimulation that we're all surrounded in okay. and we're not so exhausted that we just pass out and become unconscious? Yeah, so science has already answered this question. Huberman calls it deep rest non-sleep. Science actually has... And not Tell that me I'm, about science because well, so you're the I, spokesperson. I don't... Yeah. <laughs> No, I don't like to be like, well, science will tell you when you're resting. However, have you ever gone to the doctor and they take your blood pressure right when you get there and you've just like run from the bathroom or like yeah. you were late or you were like looking at your DMs on Instagram or fighting with your boyfriend or your mom or whoever and they take your blood pressure and it's not, it's not low. And, you know, there's, I don't think there's any medical authority, no matter what side of holistic or not that you were on that would say that a high heart rate or a high, you know, uh, blood pressure reading is an indication of rest. So what I know is I have learned to control, to be able to regulate my breathing so that I can effectively lower my blood pressure. There's also a lot of things we can do to lower our blood pressure in general. There are a lot of dietary things we can do to lower our blood pressure. Um, the times when I've done a raw flush and eaten raw, my blood pressure has been consistently unbelievable. Like not, I'm awake and alive. I have plenty of energy. But um, that's a great example of where science knows that's one of the markers and there's incredible labs doing other research on, you know, the electrical signals that come off your head and brain. I'm more interested in that because that is, for me, a next level of, of truly Yeah, there's resting. different, there's waves. <laughs> there's waves. There's uh, something called a still point in different types of um, somatic work and cranial sacral therapy. What's a still point? Tell us. So the still point is when the body literally goes into a reparative function. Mm -hmm. And so if you're able to track the, you know, in cranial sacral therapy, you're tracking a pulse that the body has. Which Chinese medicine also does, which we it's also not the heart, know. It's not the heartbeat. Correct. It's not the, um, it's not the respiratory What is it, you, you, you have, you, you've done years and years of hands-on work. What does that feel like when you're working with someone? Can you tell when they hit that? So I'm, it's hard to describe in audio, but in video, I'm sort of taking my hands right now and they're sort of being held apart from one another. And there's a slow pulsation that happens where it expands and then it comes back together. Where's the pulsing? The pulsing is in the oh, cerebral spinal body, fluid in the, per okay, in, the, got it. in the person. And you can feel the movement of that mm -hmm. sensation and it goes out and it goes in and people mm. will have different... Um, different pace for each individual mm -hmm. and sometimes the left is greater and sometimes the right is greater and when a still point happens that motion actually pauses and the body goes into what can only be described as like a bit of a hard reset it pauses and then the it, person's awake the person's awake often what they feel like is that they're riding the sensation between being awake and being asleep okay got it and there is this moment right before you fall asleep that often when you're getting this type of body work and you're in a reparative function, that it's this very, very deep rest and your mind is kind of gone away from its normal narrative and consciousness that it has. And it's not dreaming yet, but it's in an altered state. Great. And this is a still point. Okay. So what you're also describing physiologically is, you know, have you ever had too much caffeine and that, that rattly feeling that you get? You know, when you feel jittery, at all, and this is the thing, most people don't even know to tune into their body. If you tune into your body and you learn to sort of like, listen, if you can feel that there's like a pulse to your breathing, you're not in true rest, that's not resting. If you, and that's right, I am now the- So this is I'm different the than what- The wizard of rest. This is the different than what I'm talking about. No, 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 but I, I'm saying, right, I'm saying these are all indications that you're not getting towards that. So if, um, or you know, if when you have your blood pressure taken and it feels like it's like beating, 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 not in rest yet, if you try to meditate or if you're in shavasana, in yoga, um, if you feel a racing heartbeat, racing thoughts, those are all indicators that your brain is working. It's being cognitive. That's not a resting place. Sometimes people can get to this state 
when they just lay down for a nap. And if you even have your hands just yes. resting on your solar plexus or on your Correct. chest and you were monitoring your breathing, you can hit that place in between awake and asleep and uh, kind of y- ride yes. that moment for a while. But some people do have a hard time in that space because it can be scary to go in and out of what feels like sleep, but it's not really sleep. But what I wanted to say is that for thousands and thousands of years, Chinese medicine in particular has known about these things and all the different kinds of pulses that you can have, right? Did you know that? There's like 16 kinds of pulses or something in Chinese medicine. If anyone has experienced acupuncture and gone to a great practitioner, when I experience acupuncture, if I'm open and I'm able to calm down, I will often go into that place of sort of being in between states and well, yeah. sort of lose track of time and space. Yeah, so craniosacral therapy is where I've experienced this, where you go to a place that is different from awake and it's yep. different from asleep, but you can come to and feel like you napped for like three hours. Like you feel amazing. What I think is, you know, curious about when you say people don't always feel comfortable in that space, right. that space, in my humble opinion, is and this is not a scientific answer, we have access to all the information about our lives. Oh, my. Meaning... What does that mean? You know the (laughs) book, The Body Keeps Score? Yes. And this idea that we have information about what has happened to us, what we have experienced beyond what we are consciously able to access. When we drop into that... Do you mean other lives? I don't. I wasn't going there. I was meaning... More memory than we can access in a conscious state. Got it. Okay, got it. That that altered state of consciousness, that deep rest state, is a place that is beyond the limits of our normal cognition. Which is why a lot of people don't like to go there. That's what I would posit, is that people who have unmetabolized trauma, who have things that they're dealing with, which we all do it to some degree, that is a place that your awareness can really expand and open up. And from a physical somatic level, we begin to surface things that then the mind can catch up to, but it's almost a physiological led reset versus an intellectual uh, probing of understanding our experience. I think EMDR has allowed people to access this in a lot of ways. Yes, the slight difference in my understanding of EMDR is that you pick a specific moment right. and then you bring in the right. psycho, uh, the f- somatic experience and you right. map the somatic experience to allow the body to process whatever the memory is. And so mm-hmm. you start with intellect right. and then go into the body. This, on the other hand, is allowing the body to do whatever it needs to and almost taking the intellect out of the picture, which can right. be terrifying for people. Mm-hmm. All that to say is that some form of deep rest practice and accessing that level of our unconscious, I know you don't like that word. I do. Oh, you do? I don't like subconscious. Oh, great. (laughs) Add it to the list. The exploration of unconscious, because when she talks about seeing images and the intuition that that she had about what her life would entail— I mean, in many ways, that's extremely helpful because it uh, acts as a guiding post to say like, oh, I should keep going at this because I have something, not that I'm working towards an end state to fulfill those those images, but if we probed a little bit more with her, I would imagine that those images had a sensorial attachment to them. Meaning that like when she had those images of oh, her on I mean, tour or like that matched aspects of her personality that she probably felt extremely uh, seen by. So mm-hmm. if I have, for example, an image of me being super creative or something like that, I'd be like, oh, I kind of feel like whatever I'm doing, I'm moving towards that. And that, and if I feel really positive in that space based on that image, then I'm going to be like, oh, my life has an alignment that feels on track. I don't want to gloss over, but we've already talked about so many things. Um, Her mention of the Enneagram, um, I recommend going to EnneagramInstitute.com if you'd like to learn more about it. The Enneagram is, um, to put it lightly, it is a, a personality kind of assessment, and there are nine different types, and chances are you fall into one of these categories, and there's... To do the full Enneagram test, it's a lot of questions. You're technically supposed to test for every single one of the nine, and it's a lot of questions. Um, But there are shorter shorter tests you can do. Alanis and I are a four. Um, Do you remember what happened when we tried to pick my Enneagram? 
Jonathan is so terminally unique, he can't even pick one. Not true. No, the funny part for me was that you had a strong belief of a certain type of Enneagram I well, was going to be. Well, he here's the thing. The <laughs> This is really hard to talk about. The thing about Enneagram is, well, there are actually Enneagram therapists who specifically are trained in this style of analysis because what this is is the most accurate personality test I have ever experienced. And it is very rarely, it has very rarely let me down in terms of helping me better understand people based on the type that they fall into. The thing about... Uh, Go on. The thing about taking the Enneagram tests and, you know, figuring out which you are, is if you have a certain perception of yourself. Okay, I'm going to jump in right here because you're going to put your foot in your mouth. <laughs> you didn't think that my perception of myself, my self-awareness allowed me to answer the questions honestly, right? That's true. <laughs> but we went to one person in March 2020 and I got the same result. And then you kind of answered the questions for yeah, me. because you still had the same lack of self-awareness. And got the same result. But then we went to an expert who validated the first yeah, person. They don't know what it's like to be with you. <laughs> <laughs> if people want to practice their own deep rest, they should try doing it with Alanis's album. Yes, her uh, meditation album is called The Storm Before the Calm, which also I think is a John Mayer lyric from Slow Dancing in a Burning Room. Also, I really like yeah. that anyway. title because there is a lot of storm before a calm. There is a lot of storm before a calm. Um, it is um, out now, also available on calm. And I also want to mention, we didn't even get to talk to Alanis about this. She's in the middle of a European headline tour celebrating 25 years wow. of Jagged Little Pill. And it's a musical. Go to alanis.com for information on all of these things. Um... And was there something else? Hold on one second. Yeah. Those are the highlights. And we're going to practice our own deep rest. From our breakdown to the one we hope you never have. We'll see you next time. It's Maya Bialik's breakdown. She's going to break it down for you. She's got a neuroscience PhD or two. One fiction was And now she's going to break down.